Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. This patient has superbony pockets of the periodontal type. After topical anesthesia is administered, the entire area is anesthetized by infiltration anesthesia. The anesthetic solution contains 1 to 100,000 of epinephrine, which acts as a vasoconstrictor and reduces hemorrhage during the procedure. The gingivectomy procedure should not be performed unless the initial preparation has been completed. Initial preparation consists of the removal of all calculus deposits, instruction in oral hygiene procedures, and stabilization of mobile teeth. If necessary, occlusal adjustment by selective grinding, the excavation of caries, and the insertion of temporary restoration should also be completed. Initial preparation will also provide an opportunity to study the oral hygiene habits of the patient. The radiographs of this area demonstrate that there has been bone loss in the incisor, premolar, and molar region. These films, along with the clinical examination, indicate that this is an example of periodontitis. The pattern of bone loss in this area tends to be horizontal. The pockets that we're dealing with are superbony pockets of the periodontal type. Using crane Kaplan pocket markers, three markings are made on the buccal surface and three on the palatal surface of each tooth, the distal buccal, buccal, and the mesial buccal. It's important that the beaks be kept parallel to the long axis of the tooth so that an incorrect marking is not made. The clinician should examine where the base of the pockets are located and see that there is a sufficient zone of attached gingiva apical to the base of the pocket to permit the use of the gingivectomy procedure. If the base of the pocket is at or very close to the mucogingival junction, the gingivectomy procedure should not be attempted. This patient has a wide zone of attached gingiva and the pockets do not approach the mucogingival junction, so the gingivectomy may be performed. Notice that the bleeding points are well within the band of the attached gingiva, as demonstrated by the periodontal probe. Initial preparation has reduced the inflammation considerably. The resection of these pockets will be accomplished from the first molar on the maxillary left to the canine in the maxillary right. Using the number seven Goldman Fox knife, a continuous straight line incision is made first on the palatal aspect coming through the central incisor region to the distal of the canine. Rather than try and hemisection the papilla distal to the canine, the knife is carried to the middle of the palatal surface of the first premolar. This incision is taken through the tissue to the tooth and hugs the teeth as the knife is advanced anteriorly. By retracing the incision, the tissue can be cut free.
Using a number 11 interproximal knife, the interdental area is freed and the entire palatal strip removed in one section. The area is inspected to see that there are no deposits remaining on the teeth. Any tags of granulomatous tissue are removed with the curette. It's also important to see that the pockets have been completely eliminated. The clinician should check the contours of the tissue to see that a shelf does not remain which would permit food particles to be retained in the marginal area. Again, the Goldman Fox knife is used on the buccal aspect. Notice the bevel hugging the teeth. A continuous straight line incision is made with the knife at about a 45 degree angle in order to permit the establishment of a knife-like gingival margin and pyramidal shaped interdental papillae. The incision is being carried to the right canine area, ending at the buccal aspect of the first premolar. The incision will extend then from premolar to premolar. The interproximal knife is used to free the labial strip of tissue. This tissue is removed in one piece. Any loose tags of interdental tissue are now removed. Using the greater curvature of the number seven knife, any ledge or shelf can be planed away. This will permit the establishment of better physiologic contours. The curette is used to remove tissue tags. The maxillary labial frenum is severed initially with the use of soft tissue nippers. The left side is contoured in the same way as the right side, except that instead of using the greater curvature of the number seven knife, we are demonstrating the use of the soft tissue nippers which enable the establishment of an interdental spillway and a knife-like gingival margin. This is a soft tissue contouring procedure. There is no involvement with the underlying bone since these were suprabony pockets in an environment where there was a sufficient zone of attached gingiva. The maxillary frenum is being raised using the soft tissue nippers. This can also be done with a scalpel. The area is being prepared for a surgical dressing. The movement of the upper lip demonstrates that there is no pull on the interdental tissues or the gingival margins in the maxillary anterior region. The pockets have been eliminated, the contours checked. There has been no reason to expose the underlying alveolar process since there was a sufficient zone of attached gingiva which permits the use of the gingivectomy procedure. The palatal surface has also been contoured and is prepared for a surgical dressing.
The surgical dressing being applied is the Bear Sumner Pack. This is also applied to the labial surface. This pack may be reinforced with the use of a Kirkland type pack. The pack is locked interdentally by college pliers to prevent its displacement. College pliers are also helpful in adapting the pack interproximally. If there is a concern about the packing being displaced, it can be further secured with the use of adhesive dry foil. The patient is instructed to protect the pack as much as possible while the underlying tissue is healing. The dressing is usually replaced within a week. The area is muscle trimmed. The foil should not be extended beyond the margin of the pack. At a five month post-operative visit, the tissues are examined. They have healed and there is a sufficient zone of attached gingiva present. Probing indicates that there is one and one half millimeters of succular depth. The patient's oral hygiene procedures must be maintained at a high level to prevent recurrence of disease. Note the comparison between the form on the teeth that were treated, canine to canine, from those that have yet to be treated. The absence of knife-like tissues and shallow sulci in the teeth posterior to the canines is apparent. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.